Today we're going to focus on uh, the worthiness of our God and, and the excitement of what's to come. I'm looking forward to this time together as we wrap up the series we've been in in the book of Zephaniah. It's our last message together in this book, and uh, that always makes me a little sad, and so let's talk about Lord of the Rings. Um, Because I feel like every time I talk to Lord of the Rings, about Lord of the Rings up here, I talk about something that makes me cry, and I promise that's not the only emotion that I have when I read and reread and read again the series. I have lots of emotions, but let's go with another tearjerker this morning, shall we? Uh, at the end of the trilogy, at the end of The Lord of the Rings, in the third book, The Return of the King, against all odds, the good guys win the battle. Oh yeah. And they win the war, and evil is cast down, and evil is defeated once and for all. It's fantastic. And the two small hobbits, Sam and Frodo, are the ones ultimately responsible for the victory. Uh, They won the victory but they have used up all of their strength in the effort. They collapse. In victory, yes, but never expecting to be able to recover, never expecting to be found. They faint in exhaustion and expect to die on the mountainside, die on the field of their victory. Uh, But thanks to the abnormally large eagles, uh, they are rescued, unconscious, and they're brought to safety. And they, they sleep for an extraordinarily long time, for days or for weeks, they're just unconscious, recovering from this great endeavor. But one day, Sam wakes up. And when Sam wakes up, he is greeted by an old friend, Gandalf, who he thought he was died. And then all his other companions come in. He's reunited with the fellowship, and joy spreads. And there's tears, and celebration, and laughter, and, and joy, and joy, and joy for the glorious reunion at the end of of the war, and in dumbstruck awe, Sam asks this haunting question. He says this, is everything sad going to come untrue? What has happened to the world? Tolkien knew this about us. Tolkien knew that we all long for redemption. Whether we acknowledge it or not, deep in our soul, we long for the wrong to be made right. We long for wound to be healed, for the hurt to be comforted. We long for all to be redeemed and restored. We long for things to be made right. And while it seems like an impossible dream at times, deep in us, deep in us is this hint of hope, this hint of hope deep down that maybe, just maybe, everything sad is going to come untrue. Maybe, just maybe, redemption will come. Today is the day of redemption in the book of Zephaniah. After two and a half chapters of judgment and battle and sword, the glorious restoration of all things is triumphantly announced in chapter 3. And the best news of all, of course, is that Zephaniah is not a myth or a fairy tale. Zephaniah is a prophet who speaks the words of truth from the one true God. And so all that he says, this prophecy will indeed come true at the very end of our age. And so as we read this morning, we await and we hope and we will surely one day we will see the day of redemption. We will see the day that all will be made right. We will see the day that death will die. The day that he will come. And so let's read this morning and celebrate with the prophet what the Lord our God will bring to pass in his good time. Let's read. Starting in chapter 3, starting in verse 9, we'll go all the way through the end of the book in verse 20. It says this, For at that time I will change the speech of my peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain." 
But I will leave in your midst a people, humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall they be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, for they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments from against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fare evil. On that day it shall be said in Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hand grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness, and he will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time, when I gather you together, for I will make your name renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your revelation. We thank you, Lord, for this message of hope and promise and redemption. God, I pray that we would rejoice, Lord, as we're called to rejoice in your, in your soon coming presence. God, this morning I pray that you would meet with us here. I pray that we would encounter you, God, and that we'd be changed. That we'd be changed by meeting with you, the true and living God, who is, who was, who is to come. We rejoice in you, God. Meet with us here. Let us be changed by the encounter. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All those weeks ago, back in January, we looked at Zephaniah as he began his book of sermons with the promise of the great uncreating, back in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. God in judgment was coming to undo the work that he had done in the beginning. God was coming to wipe clean his treasonous creation from the face of the earth. And this was just, and this is holy, and this is right. Now, I do say again, the judgment of Zephaniah 1 is coming. It's still coming. It is a future end times event that will occur. And it is sure. And it is final. It is the final judgment. And nothing, nothing will alter God's plan to come and do justice at the end of time. Amen? Amen. But God, being God, doesn't leave it there. By mercy upon mercy, Zephaniah reveals in chapter 3 that after the uncreating, God is not finished. Because after the uncreating, God will begin recreating. God is a God of recreating, redemption. Now, to the glory of God, to the wonder of grace, we're revealed here in the text that the Lord will begin that recreation right at the heart of it, right in Jerusalem, right where he promised it to begin. You see, God is in the business of redemption. That's who he is. And it is his delight. It is his nature. It is his character to redeem, to take that which was lost and to bring it back, to take that which was broken and to fix it, to heal it, to take that which was enslaved and to buy it back and restore it as son and daughter. That is our God. He loves to redeem. And so after all the tough business of judgment in Zephaniah 1 and 2, the Lord God turns his prophet Zephaniah to this message of hope and promise that God will do all that he said he would do that God will bless the whole world, that God will redeem what he promised to redeem, and he will do it through Israel, the people of promise. There are three points this morning. Uh, That's not a surprise to any of you. And uh, this isn't a surprise either, that these three points 
are going to align perfectly with that covenant which serves as the foundation for the message of all of the prophets, God's covenant with Abraham. It really is the foundational uh, theme, the foundational uh, covenant for all the rest of the Old Testament and and well into the New Testament. Zephaniah's message in chapter 3 is that God's promise to future covenant faithfulness will remain. And I pray that as we study God's faithfulness, that we will come to love and delight in our God who loves to redeem. Our God who washes, who gathers, and restores. I pray that this is uh, a day of worship of our God. So let's start where God starts. Point number one this morning, faithfulness. God will restore the land. Point number one this morning, faithfulness. God will restore the land. In chapters 1 through ver- chapter 3, verse 8, Zephaniah prophesied again concerning the judgment that God was bringing on Judah for their rebellion and wickedness. And we said that this prophecy, like most Old Testament prophets, had a layered fulfillment, right? We talked about how Old Testament prophecies can be like a range of mountains where when you look afar off, you just see a flat plain of mountains, but really there's large valleys in between, or we talked about how it's like Jack Sparrow with the telescope, how, uh, again, that was the only picture I could find, I'm sorry guys, that that if you look at the telescope all pulled in, you see the broad picture, but when you telescope it out, you'll see the details in the text, and that's kind of how judgment was, and so uh, we said that this prophecy of judgment in the earlier chapters of Zephaniah was layered, that the first layer was to come in in just a few years later in the judgment that would come through the Babylonian conquest of Judah from 603 to 586 BC. And and, and his prophecies in this book can be interpreted to, to reflect the coming invasion that God would use to discipline his people. But, but, that wasn't the end of the day of the Lord, the end of the judgment. It didn't fit that, that the scriptures revealed that the big day of the Lord, the capital D day of the Lord, the great day of the Lord, uh, the great judgment would come at the end times, during the great tribulation. And this fits all of the data found in the text and is corroborated by the New Testament prophecies as well. We are awaiting the coming day of the Lord. It's yet future. Now, in chapter 3, Zephaniah is prophesying restoration, and specifically a return to the land, security in that land, and then favorable land conditions in the time to come. And so our question is, what is he talking about? When will this occur? What, what is the fulfillment of the prophecies of restoration to the land found in Zephaniah chapter 3? Now, from all the evidence within the text, this passage does not seem to have a layered fulfillment. From all of the evidence in this text, it does not seem to be talking about a near fulfillment at all. Rather, this text is talking about the yet future kingdom of God, which according to Revelation 20 through 21, will come at the return of Christ after the day of the Lord. Again, this is talking about the coming kingdom of God, which will happen after the day of the Lord. We are clued into this by the phrase, at that time, in verse 9. If you read the Old Testament, whenever it says, at that time, it's talking about the end times. It's talking about the end days. It's used throughout the Old Testament. In addition, the events that are predicted in this text uh, have no historical fulfillment in the past events of Israel. But they do line up perfectly with the testimony of all the other prophets and the testimony of the book of Revelation that talk about what will happen at the end times. So what we have here this morning in this text, we have here a glimpse into the future, a prophecy concerning what will occur at the end at the redemption of the world to come. This morning we are talking about future events. Now, what is testified to in this text? Let's talk about the details here. What is testified to in this text is that during the kingdom to come, during the kingdom to come, the preserved remnant of Israel will possess the promised land. 
that in the kingdom to come, the remnant of Israel, the descendants of Israel, will possess the promised land. Now, all of you should be going, well, duh, Jared, that's what God said to Abraham. Don't you remember that? You taught us that. Yeah, exactly, okay? This is the future. This is what God has promised. Look with me in the text. In verses 18 through 20, uh, God promises to gather the scattered and bruised remnant of Israel back into the land, back into his care. And in verses 11 and 13, Zephaniah promises that the Israelites will dwell in Jerusalem. And while they dwell there, they'll find blessing and security there in the Lord. Israel will be returned to the land that God promised and they will have possession of it forever and will no longer need to fear or fight to defend its borders. In fact, they'll be living in that land restored to paradise-like conditions as before the fall. This is what was promised Abraham 1,400 years prior and this is what Zephaniah testifies to here and this is what God will accomplish in the future on behalf of his promise and his covenant and his faithfulness. God will restore Israel to the land and keep them there forever. Now, I don't have the time and space here today to go through the entire theology of Israel and the land and restoration, but I heard that if you buy the, senior pa- uh, the teaching pastor a cup of coffee and give him two hours of the whiteboard... Oh, come on. It was a long time. Come on. It's been months since I made that joke, all right? Uh, I just thought I'd slide it in there one more time. Anyways, I don't have time to go through all the details. I would love to talk to you about all the details of the land and the restoration and why it matters. But I I do want to say this here, that we do believe uh, in the alliance, we do believe that this is a literal future and imminent fulfillment of this word. In the future... God will bring great tribulation down on the earth, literally. It's literally coming. And then God will literally come and literally gather and restore literal Israel to the literal land that was promised to them. And they will literally dwell in that land forever, just as he said. I think I'm for the literal interpretation of the text. What do you think? Now, according to the best interpretation, and and brothers and sisters, there's other believers who believe differently about this, and we love them. It's not an issue to to divide over. They're wrong, but we love them, and it's okay to be wrong. We forgive them for that. But but according to our interpretation, and, and what I think is the best interpretation of the text, this is not some vague spiritual reality. This is not some vague spiritualized application No, this is a future literal reality that God will bring to pass in his own strength and his own time and his own power just as he brought to pass the messianic prophecies of Jesus' first coming. Just how we saw that the prophecies concerning Jesus' first coming fulfilled literally in the first century AD in Jerusalem. Yes, literal, okay. We will see these prophecies of the kingdom be fulfilled literally in the future in who knows what year and date, okay? But it's coming. God is not done with his promise. God is not done with his people. God never gives up on Israel. He will do just as he says. Now, Zephaniah wanted Judah to know this, okay? Remember, Zephaniah is preaching in the 7th century B.C. in Jerusalem, okay? And he wanted those people to to know this. He wanted them to hear their message. He wanted their hearts to be stirred with affection and loyalty to a God that was unendingly loyal to them. I mean, he he had just told them how much they had sinned and betrayed God, how much treason and idolatry they had been practicing, how much injustice that they had been wrapped up in. And now, just one sermon later, he's saying, but God is still faithful. He has not forgotten his promises. He wanted them to hear this. And he wanted this message of hope and faithfulness to drive them to repentance and to drive them to trust and to worship and to obedience. It's it's, it's the carrot as the rebuke was the stick, okay? It's what God is going to do. Now, we the church are not Israel. Okay? We the church are not Israel. And therefore, we do not have Israel's 
land deed to inherit the literal land. This is not a direct promise to you and I that we will inherit the land. Uh, You don't have a deed to 30 square feet in Israel up in heaven waiting for you directly. So why does this matter? Why is it important? You're like, Jared, um, I came here this morning after a long week of work uh, and, and my boss was mean and the kids didn't sleep well and uh, the, other, the other team's coach was a jerk and yada, 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 yada and the Rangers lost yesterday to the Boston Bruins and I'm miserable, okay? And, and why does this matter? What does it do for me? Well, in a little bit, I'm going to show you about us. I'm going to talk about the church in the kingdom. We have a role in the kingdom. But on a more fundamental level, this faithfulness of God to Israel is a testimony of the character of our God. This testimony of God's faithfulness to Israel is a testimony to every last one of us who live and breathe the promises that he has made to us. Israel had wandered as far from God as one could possibly have imagined. The blessed and promised and privileged people of Israel had been given every advantage, every advantage for their spiritual life, and yet, yet they had messed it up horrendously, messed it up treacherously again and again and again and again, century after century after century after century. They had betrayed their God. Now, God had judged and disciplined them soundly. But even against his words, they still would not listen. At the worst moment in history yet to come from this text, the people would reject their own Messiah. Reject the Messiah born of their own flesh and blood. They would reject the Christ. And yet... And yet, God has still not broken or revoked the promise that he made to Abraham all those years before. Do you get that? God had still not abandoned them. God had kept reassuring them of his integrity to the covenant. God has not bent. God has not wavered. God has not broken. God will do exactly as he said he will do. And if God will do exactly as he said he will do with Israel, the beautiful news is that God will surely do just as he said he will do for you. Our God is faithful. You can trust and rely on Him. He keeps His promises. He does what He says He will do. He does not lie or deceive or give up. He remains faithful to us despite our unfaithfulness, despite our shortcomings. This is the God that we are in a relationship with. We're in relationship with a faithful God and Father who won't quit on us. That's our God. That's our God. And we can trust ourselves to his hand. Man, I'm going to have to come down and get a tissue to wipe my forehead. My goodness. Going back to my Baptist days up here. My goodness. Woo! I won't won't start the bad accent in the folks, I promise, okay? Guys, we can trust ourselves in God's hand. We can trust him to restore. We can trust him to redeem. We can trust him to save us. He has promised us eternal life. He has promised to be with us. He has promised to forgive us our sins. He has promised uh, never to abandon us. He has promised that there is no more condemnation, no more judgment for those who have been forgiven. He has promised us that He will intercede for us with the Father. He has promised that He he is our High Priest. He has promised uh, that His sacrifice is sufficient. God has promised to be faithful to us who believe in Him, us, the body of Christ. God will be faithful. God keeps His promises. And you can live out your life trusting in His Word, trusting in His promise. There is no greater or surer thing. Well, 
Point number one, God in faithfulness, God will restore the land. Point number two this morning, faithfulness, God will restore the people. Point number two this morning, faithfulness, God will restore the people. In chapters 1 through 3, 8, Zephaniah had laid bare all of the treason and all of the faithlessness of Judah. We preached these two sermons, point one and part one and part two of why does God bring judgment against his people? And the crimes were, were bad. <laughs> he laid out their evil with all of its consequences. Judah had been unfaithful. Jerusalem had been treacherous. And all of this had led to gross immorality, gross oppression, and proud self-glorification. Now, in chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, Zephaniah starts to describe a people that can do no wrong in the eyes of God. He starts to describe a people who are humble, a people who are lowly, a people who trust in the Lord, a people who desire what God desires, a people who worship fervently in this city, who are passionate about worshiping God. And the miraculous part is that Zephaniah is talking about the same people. In chapter 3, the prophet does not just promise that there will be a preservation of a physical remnant of Judah's descendants, he promises that someday there will be a spiritual transformation of the people of Israel. That there will be a total redemption, regeneration, new life. God is going to transform the people of Israel to all that they were meant to be. Remember Abraham's mission. The people of Israel were meant to uh, were, were to be the means by which God would bring all peoples to himself, right? Remember this in Genesis 12. Through in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The plan was always beyond the borders. Through Abraham and his descendants, God was going to bring all peoples to himself. It was never just about Israel. It was through Israel to the ends of the earth. This was God's plan. This was God's mission. But the people were never able to live up to that mission, right? All through the Old Testament, sin and treachery and idolatry continually got in the way of the people of Israel fulfilling the mission that God had for them to the nations. They continued to fall short. They became like the nations around them rather than having God's character reflected to the nations around them. Now, here in this text, it's prophesied and promised that in the kingdom to come, Sin will be removed out of the way so that the people, the people of Israel, can be all that God meant for them to be. In the kingdom to come, the people of Israel will live out the mission. And this is precisely what Zephaniah preaches here in the text. In verses 11 and 13, the Lord says that in that time, in the kingdom, there will be no more self-glorifying and proud Israelites, only humble and believing ones. There will be no injustice and corruption in the city of Jerusalem, only peace and protection. Look at verse 15. It says that God is going to clear away all evil and clear away all judgment. Nothing of the curse of sin will be able to touch them any longer. And instead, in the kingdom of God, the people of Israel will live holy and pure lives before the Lord their God forever and ever. Walter C. Kaiser says here, he says this, This new people of God are once again called the remnant. They are those who have been cleansed by the Lord and who now remain in the land. They are pictured in this new day of the millennium as being free of all unrighteousness, deception, or duplicity. In that day, there will be no perversity, treachery, crookedness, fraud, intrigue, cheating, or deceit. God would make a people holy for himself. Now, as a result of this, and due to the work of God in the hearts of the world, the mission will go forward. In the kingdom of God, the mission will go forward. The mission will finally succeed. The nations will come down and will come and bow down before the one true God. They will worship God. This is what's spoken of in verses 9 and 10. God will change the hearts, he says lips here, to pure speech, but out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? God will change the hearts of the people of all nations so they will become worshipers alongside the Israelites. 
Nations that were just cursed in chapter 2 are now joining in the song of the redeemed in chapter 3. You see, with sin removed, Israel will be continuously accomplishing their mission as priests, their mission as a holy nation for the whole world to see, and the whole world will see and be changed by the work of God through the nation of Israel in the kingdom to come. God will accomplish it. God will do it. In verse 20, God says that all the peoples of the earth will celebrate what God has done. And then get this, all the peoples of the world will honor the people of Israel for their role in God's plan. They'll honor them. They'll say, God, what marvelous work you have done. Let us honor these people that you have brought together to be the holy nation for the world to see. Now, again, all of this is still yet future, okay? This has not occurred yet. If there was no other reason, has the whole earth been blessing Israel for the last 2,000 years? No. Oh, no. This is yet future. We are talking about things that happened during the millennial reign. We're talking about things that are going to happen in the coming kingdom of God. We see this playing out in the book of Revelation. It starts in chapter 7, during the tribulation, as God moves to first bring Israel to himself, and then uses Israel to bring people from all nations. There's a great mission going on during the great tribulation. And then all of this is brought to fruition during the kingdom in Revelation chapter 20 and 21. Okay, God is bringing all of this prophecy to, to, to fruition in the kingdom to come. The kingdom described in Revelation chapter 20. Okay, key note here, again, just making it clear, the church is not the fulfillment of the Gentile believers from the tribulation and in the kingdom. The church is not the people from verses 9 and 10. Even the church in Ethiopia and Sudan who are from Cush, as described in verse 10, are not the complete fulfillment of this prophecy. The complete fulfillment of this prophecy will be Gentile converts to Christ during the tribulation who enter into the kingdom of God at the return of Christ. In the kingdom, the Lord will be glorified with worship from all the nations of the earth. And in the kingdom, they will bring their worship through Jerusalem as God intended them all throughout the Old Testament. Again, the church has another role. I'm getting there, I promise. I will talk about you, all right? If you're anything like me, your favorite thing to hear about is things about me or things about you, uh, however that works, okay? And I will get there, I promise. But right now, this isn't directly talking about us. This is what God is doing for other people during the tribulation and the kingdom to come. The church has a role to play. I'll get there in the next point. But this isn't us, okay? Let's, let's bring this back down to Zephaniah. Okay, let's bring this back down to chat, Zephaniah in, in Jerusalem in the 7th century BC. All right, let's boil this back down. Remember that Zephaniah's primary goal is that the people hear this message, repent of their sin and faithlessness, and humbly believe in the Lord. Zephaniah is a preacher. His main goal isn't that they finally understand the details of the tribulation. His main goal is that they hear, repent, and believe based on what God has told them here. All right? Then if they will believe, they will be hidden in God in the day of judgment and wrath. And so here in this text, here in this chapter, Zephaniah is preaching two options to the individual people of Judah in that day. He's standing before them on the street corner saying this or that, one or the other, choose this day. He's saying, first, if you repent today and ask the Lord for mercy, then this future described here in this text will be your future. This future in this text will be your future when you are resurrected to this transformed life in the kingdom to come. He was saying, my fellow brothers and sisters in Israel, join the remnant today and have this as your future. God will resurrect you. God will be faithful. You will see the kingdom come. Repent and believe today. 
That was Zephaniah's message to Judah. But there was the other option. He was saying, if you continue in faithlessness, if you continue in rebellion, you will take no part in the kingdom of God. You will have no part in eternal life. Choose this day, blessing or judgment, forgiveness or condemnation. This was the offer that Zephaniah was making. You see, God was surely going to preserve a remnant of faithful Israelites throughout the ages. God was surely going to bring Israelites into this kingdom life described in Zephaniah 3. And Zephaniah was inviting them to believe and to join in. Believe and join in. To wait for this day to come. And to hold on despite the enemies, despite the troubles. To hold on, hold on to the promise despite all of the turmoil that surrounded them. And they will hold on to the promise. They will trust in the Lord above all else. They will be saved. And they will be rewarded in the day to come. Let's talk about reward, shall we? Point number one, God will restore the land. Point number two, God will restore the people. Point number three, faithfulness. God will restore the blessing. Let's talk about reward. God will restore the blessing. I want to get to the best part here. The reward, the real reward, the real end goal of transformation, the real end goal of redemption, the real end goal is the pleasure and presence of God himself forever and ever. The pleasure and presence of God. As we saw in the other chapters, Israel had tried to separate from their God. And God had become righteously indignant at the affront But God's rich love overcame every barrier. And he will come to dwell in the midst of his people forever. This is his faithfulness to the covenant he made with Abraham. His persistence on the promise that he made to Moses. And his final fulfillment of the covenant he made to David. God will come and dwell with man. This is what we're promised in this text. That God will come and dwell with man with Israel in the end days. Look with me back in the passage. This whole passage drips with the language of reconciled relationship. In verse 9, God works on the lips of the people so they can worship Him. In verses 11 and 13, the Lord removes the guilt and shame from Israel's adultery so they can take refuge in Him and find peace in His presence. But the real core of it is found in 14 through 18. Some of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture. Some of the most beautiful promises of God's future faithfulness to Israel. This text here is so critical. But So let's talk about Lord of the Rings again. Um, I'm serious. Let's get here. I want to give you another illustration here. The people of Gondor had been without a king for centuries. Long ago, their line of heirs, their line of kings had been lost. And in the stead of a king, in the absence of a king, there reigned a long line of stewards. Some noble, some corrupt like Denethor, the stewards rightfully ruled in the absence of their king. Now, in the story of the ring, there's a subplot about the return of the rightful king. Aragorn, the the heir of the lost line, the, the heir of the line of kings had appeared again out of the north and he came to conquer the evil of the world before he came to sit on the throne of his long lost birthright. Strider was coming to take over as king. Now there's a whole lot of great drama to it. Hundreds of pages of good reading. I hope you go home and read them. But in the end, uh, evil is overcome and the king ascends to the capital city to be crowned. And this is the part that gets me. For centuries, the city had flown the banner of the stewards. It was a plain white standard, a plain white flag, and it marked the absence of the king. For centuries, the city flew a flag that represented that they had no king. But now, for the first time in ages, at the coronation of the long lost king, after evil has been thrown down, now the banners of the king, black with the white tree and stars, were 
flown from every battlement and every tower because the king was in the city, his banner was flown on the walls. And the people celebrated and the people cheered. The author wrote this, he wrote, The reign of King Alessar began, of which many songs have been told. When the king sat on the throne, when his banners were flung on the city gates, the beautiful reign had begun. Church, look with me at verse 15. Zephaniah chapter 3, 14 through 18 is promise and prophecy that the king is going to return to the city. And at the end of the age, after his long absence, the king and heir will enter his city and take his rightful throne and his banners will be unfurled and his songs will be sung aloud and he will reign from his throne forever and ever and ever. The king will come, the king of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never fear evil and the king is Jesus. The king was always Jesus. And the plan of redemption that God has for his people Israel is to make them clean and safe and righteous so they can be the rightful citizens of the kingdom of God, the rightful people of the kingdom of the king. This is no fairy tale. This is no novel. This is no fake. This is the reality of our future, of our world. This is what's coming. This is what's coming. Jesus is coming. The King of Israel. And He will rule over them. Look with me at these verses again. Look at all the beauty and peace that flows from His reign. Look at verses 15 and 16. In verses 15 and 16, He promises security from all evil and violence. Evil and violence will have no place in the reign of the true king. Amen? No Philistine, no Assyrian will ever raise their sword against Israel again. The king is in their midst. In verse 18, it says that no reproach and no rebuke will ever come against them. They will no longer need discipline against evil or against sin. Evil and sin has been banished from the hearts of the people of God. They'll never need judgment again. And in verses 19 through 20, it says the lame will be made whole, the outcast will be gathered in, and those ashamed will be forgiven and cleansed and made holy to bring forth holy worship because the king of the Jews, the king of Israel is reigning in their midst and God will do for them all that he promised and so much more. The king is in their midst and so the people are redeemed. David W. Baker says here, he says, when the creator is worshipped and served as he ought to be, paradise is regained. And Zephaniah describes a paradise on earth restored. This is the future of our world. Higher than any other hope is verse 17. Verse 17, the people of Israel... Uh, received this. The same we read about before. The same people. The same people that had sinned against God. The people of Israel will no longer bring any grief to the heart of God. Instead, look what it says here. God will be delighted with them forever and ever. God will assure them of His love and good pleasure. Intimate, joy-filled, Holy fellowship between God the Creator and man, His creation. God is going to dwell with man. God is going to dwell with Israel. God is going to come and make His home here on earth, living with them with even more closeness than you and I have in this room right now. And never again will judgment come on the people of Israel. Never again will God judge His people. He will delight and rejoice over them. This is God's faithfulness to Israel. Dr. Ron Allen says it beautifully here. He says, God's desire is not to vaporize mankind, but to make man fit to live in his presence. This has been God's plan, God's work from the get-go. The goal, the end, is relationship. Pure and perfect relationship. Eternal relationship. And Zephaniah desperately wanted the people to know that what God wanted for them 
was relationship. God wanted to redeem them, to restore them, to dwell with them, to love them forever and ever. If they would seek the Lord by faith now, if they'd seek the Lord by faith in the day of Zephaniah, then God would deliver them and hold on to them forever and ever and ever and ever, and nothing, nothing could separate them from their God. Tragically, only a few heard the message. Tragically, only a few heard the message that Zephaniah preached. But we do know that some did. A faithful remnant of faithful, believing Jews were preserved in the day of Zephaniah. And someday they will be resurrected to this reward. God was not done with them. He didn't throw them away. He was going to rescue and redeem This is the faithfulness of the Lord God. Now, notice again, I haven't said us. I've said them this whole time, right? This is because we are not Israel. We are the church. We are not the direct inheritors of this promise and this prophecy. We have not replaced Israel. We have not plundered their covenants with God. We have not received this promise. This promise is for Abraham's descendants, for the 12 tribes, for the descendants from the Exodus, and it will be their promise forever and ever and ever. So again, you're saying, where in the world are we in all this? (laughs) You've talked about this beautiful kingdom to come. Man, I want to be there too. Why can't that be my promise? Why can't I be there? Isn't Jesus our king as well? Isn't the kingdom of God for us too? Where is the church in the kingdom to come? Well, in answer to your question, is the kingdom of God for us too? The answer, of course, is of course the kingdom of God is for us too. And there is one verse in this chapter that does include us, does include the church, does include you and I sitting here today who have believed. It's verse 15 again. Look what it says It says, the king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. According to the New Testament, we, the church, we, God's people for this time, are the bride of Christ, yes? We are his body. We are so united with Jesus Christ due to to his death and resurrection. We are so united to him in our regeneration that we receive Jesus' righteousness as our own, yes? And we receive sonship from God as our own because we're in Christ, yes? And important here, according to Romans 8.17, we are heirs to the inheritance that Christ is heir to. We are co-heirs with Christ, yes? So where are we in Zephaniah chapter 3? Where is the church? Where am I? Where are you? What are we doing during this time? Where are we in the kingdom to come? We are exactly where our king is. Because where our king is, is where his body and his bride and his co-heir is going to be. We, the church, are going to be at the side of the king forever and ever and ever and ever. Where are we? We, We're right with Jesus, right where we belong. In the mystery of all mysteries, we, the church, we, the body of Christ, are given the highest honor of ruling and reigning alongside the Son of God forever and ever and ever. We're not the citizens, we're not the people of the kingdom of God as described in Zephaniah chapter 3 because in grace upon grace upon grace upon grace, we're the rulers of it with our King and our Savior Christ. It almost sounds wrong, doesn't it? It's like, us? Really? What are you talking about? Uh, I wouldn't think it was wrong too, except for Scripture. Look with me here. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 3. The saints will judge the world. The saints. 2 Timothy 2, 12. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Revelation chapter 5, 9 and 10. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. 
from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they, the church, shall reign on earth. Revelation chapter 20, 4 through 6, all of them and so many more all testify to this mind-bending truth that by grace and grace and grace, we, the body of Christ, share in the inheritance of our Savior and King. In resurrected bodies with white robes and crowns on our head, we, the church, will rule and reign with Christ over the kingdom of God. Now, please don't ask me the details of what that means. I have no clue. The Bible doesn't say it. I don't know if we have administrative function. Keith, I don't know if you're doing Jesus' taxes forever. I have no clue. I don't know what that means. I don't know if it actually means we, we actively work in the kingdom or if all we do is sit back and watch Jesus work. I don't know what exactly that means because it's not revealed in the scriptures. But I do know this. I do know for certain that whatever we're doing in the kingdom of God alongside Jesus, it will be the most purpose-filled, the most glorifying, and the most satisfying eternal life that we could possibly ever experience because we are with our King. We have the joy of being with him. We have the joy of worshiping him. We have the joy of serving with him. We have the great honor, the great privilege, the front row seats to sit and to see all that God is doing, all God's faithfulness to Israel, all the redemption of the nations and to his son. I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to be there. And if you're hidden in Christ, like Christ hid me in himself, you will be there too. This is your future, together with Christ forever and ever. With Him, forever and ever. We are going to reign in the city with Him. What grace, what wonder, what glory. Well, church, this is the end of our study in Zephaniah. God spoke to him. God spoke to the prophet. And then he spoke these words just over 2,600 years ago. And when he spoke them, he spoke them to real people. Real people struggling. Real people in bondage to sin and sing against their God. He preached honestly. He preached both justice and mercy. Yes? He spoke of wrath and he spoke of redemption. Most importantly, Zephaniah spoke with clarity and with honor about our God. We don't have any information on what happened to him next. Zephaniah disappears from the pages of our Bible and the pages of history. We have no clue. We do know that there was a partial revival in Israel under the leadership of King Josiah around the same time. Some repented, some believed. But this would only stem the tide for a few decades until the fall was so great that judgment came, just as Zephaniah said it would. Judgment came as Nebuchadnezzar, emperor of Babylon, stormed the gates, destroyed the temple, and brought the wrath of God on the people of God in that day. But God was not done being faithful to Israel. Seventy years later, God restored them to the land, and in the centuries that followed, God sent them their Savior, their King, sent them their Messiah, born in a manger. We today, the body of Christ, we await His return. We await the day of His coming. We await the fulfillment of the promise. We await the return of the king. We are a people waiting. I'm going to end this right here today. Please, please don't let this be the last time you find yourself studying the Old Testament prophets. <laughs> uh, during this time, I, I definitely wanted to teach you the content of this text. I wanted to show you God and justice and holiness and mercy and grace and restoration. I wanted to show you the content of this text, but I also hope that I've been able to show you uh, some of the tools used to approach these texts. 
because understood in their original context with the foundation of the covenants, these Old Testament prophets are some of the most beautiful and rich words about our God that have ever been written. And so I do invite you to come and see our God. To come and worship Him. To come and find faithfulness and love like never before. I invite you to come. To come and believe. I invite you to come to the Lord. He won't let you down.